Well, this morning we uh, bring our journey with Amos to a close. So let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the journey we have shared together as we have read and as we have reflected on the ministry and message of Amos. And Lord, as we come to look at this concluding part, as always, we pray that your spirit would speak its truth afresh into our hearts. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, Many years ago at a seminar I was attending, uh, the speaker made the comment that they, as a hobby, they enjoyed watching movies. Well, that was really not a moment of uh, amazing revelation for those who were at the seminar because most of us at the seminar also enjoyed watching movies. But what grabbed our attention was their comment that one of the things that they always look for in every movie was moments of redemption. No matter how bad the movie may be or how good it might be, uh, the speaker always went searching as he watched the movies to see if there were redemptive moments portrayed in the movie. You know, sometimes those uh, moments of redemption come at the end of the movie and most people you know, enjoy those moments. But in many films, those moments of redemption are often quite fleeting. Uh, they are often brief moments when a character in the movie shows grace in their actions or when they behave in ways that run counter to the prevailing culture. Now, there are often uh, moments that a lot of the contemporary preachers will grab as a bit of a video illustration. They'll use that in their preaching. Because most people like those redemptive moments. Yet we like the narrative in which the story comes to a satisfactory end where justice is done, you know, love is discovered, and it is a very old literary form, often expressed in the fairy tales and romantic stories, you know, when the end phrase is, they all lived happily ever after. You know, our human nature wants neat and positive conclusions to narratives. Even if the story is confronting and disturbing, you know, we still want it to finish on a positive note. Well, when we turn to this last chapter in Amos, if you've actually read all of the last chapter, which we didn't do this morning, we encounter something of that desire to finish with a positive note. Now, after eight and a half chapters of confronting words of judgment, we get to the last half of chapter nine, and we are somewhat surprised to encounter words of hope, words of assurance, words that provide a positive end to what has been a very challenging and disturbing narrative through Amos. The only problem we have is that those positive words of hope in the last half of chapter 9 have nothing to do with the ministry of Amos. From the second half of verse 8 through to the end of verse 15, what we have are later additions written into the Amos text by someone who wanted to take all the strong messages of judgment against Israel and apply them to the people of Judah who were sort of slipping their ways. And so the final words of hope that you read at the end of Amos are for the people of Judah. They're not there for the people of Israel. The reality is that the original book of Amos does not change its tone. It is a confronting message of judgment. It has no happy ending for the people of Israel. And so when we read verses 1 to 8 of this final chapter, They are more confronting words that flow from the ministry of Amos. And they are words that not only confront the people of Israel, but they also continue to confront each of us. And so as we bring our journey through Amos to an end this morning, we are confronted by two further challenges by Amos. And the first one is confronting worship. Now in verse 1 we read these words of Amos. I saw the Lord standing by the altar. And then he continues to then say what God said. This introduces us to the fifth vision that Amos has, and it comes to Amos as he stands in the sanctuary at Bethel beside the altar. And Amos is standing at the place where the people expected to encounter the presence of Yahweh. And when Amos declares that he sees Yahweh standing by the altar, it is a statement of authority to those who are listening that, Amos is speaking to 
through the authority of Yahweh. Now, for the people who have gathered for worship at Bethel, this would have initially been a very special moment. Now, when they came to the altar, they came with an expectation and a hope that you know, the divine presence of Yahweh would be there. And when they brought their sacrifices, they came with a desire to meet with Yahweh and his presence would be a sign that their offerings and sacrifices were acceptable. And so for Amos to stand at that altar and declare that he sees Yahweh standing beside the altar, that's an amazing word of affirmation for those who have gathered for worship. You know, it's a word that stirs their hearts. It's a word that raises their expectations because here in this moment of worship as they gather in Bethel, they have this affirmation that Yahweh is present. And that fits their narrative about worship because their expectation is that when they come to worship Yahweh, they will experience the favour of Yahweh. When they come and bring their offerings and sacrifices to Yahweh, they expect to receive a positive affirmation from Yahweh. Now, as far as the people are concerned, their experience of worship should always be positive, should always be uplifting. This is why they delighted so much in coming and offering their sacrifices. They liked that spiritual high that their worship brought into their lives. Well, think for a moment about what takes place when Amos starts to give Yahweh's message as he stands there at the altar. The people have come with an expectations of a positive experience. They hear from Amos that you know, Yahweh is present in their midst. He's there beside them at the altar. And so their overwhelming emotion is one of joy and happiness. They are worshipping Yahweh and Yahweh is present. And then Amos declares the words of Yahweh. And the words are confronting and they are brutal. The uh, words, not only words of judgment, but they are words that express the absolute completeness of that coming judgment. Now, for those who have gathered for worship at the sanctuary of Bethel, Amos declares that the very structure in which they are standing will be destroyed. Yahweh will strike the pillars, he will shake the thresholds, and this sanctuary will come down on the heads of the people. But this confronting word does not stop with the destruction of Bethel. The word from Yahweh is that any who survive the destruction of Bethel, well, they're going to be killed by the sword. No one's going to get away. There will be no escape. And to emphasize how complete this act of judgment will be, Amos goes on in verses 2 to 4 to set out the parameters within which this judgment will take place. Now, if the people try to escape to Sheol, the place of the dead, or if they climb to the heavens where Yahweh is present, there will be no escape. There is nowhere in the universe that they will be able to hide. If they try and climb Mount Carmel or try and hide in the depths of the sea, there will be no escape. There is nowhere in the known world that they will be able to hide from Yahweh. And even if they are taken off into exile, that too will not save them. For them, even exile, they will be slain by their enemies. It is a devastating announcement of complete judgment that reflects the awareness in Psalm 139 that there is no place we can go that will separate us from God. In this case, in Amos, there is nowhere the Israelites can hide to escape the judgment of Yahweh. And to reinforce this confronting message, Amos announces in verse 4 that Yahweh will keep his eye on the people of Israel. Except he won't keep his eye on them for their good. He's going to keep his eye on them for their harm. Now, for a people who came in worship seeking the attention of Yahweh, in the belief that you know, this would enrich their lives, 
this declaration that they now have the attention of Yahweh for their harm is devastating. Such is the absolute nature of this judgment that Yahweh will bring to the people of Israel. Now in verses 5 and 6, there is a short little interlude of a hymn to Yahweh, which is reflective of other hymn fragments that are inserted into the text that seek to give glory to Yahweh and his majestic work. In the context of chapter 9, they just remind us of who Yahweh is, who is announcing this judgment. It is the universal God, the sovereign creator. Well, as we encounter this confronting experience of worship that the people of Israel experience at Bethel, it raises a rather interesting question for us. What do we expect to get out of our experiences of worship when we come here on a Sunday morning? What are our expectations of worship? Now, over the past 40, 50 years since the emergence of the worship renewal movement, there has been a great emphasis on the worship experience. Most of the church growth experts over recent years you know, have placed great emphasis on the importance of creating a positive worship experience. In fact, the whole worship package has now become a key marketing tool for churches. If you check out many of the websites of the larger churches, you know, they're filled with images and videos that promote you know, positive experiences of worship with their worship bands, with everyone raising their hands and so forth. And we are now at the point, I think, where churches are judged by the quality of their worship, except worship nowadays is defined very narrowly in terms of their music. Now, none of this is particularly new in terms of church behaviour. Uh, people have always evaluated the church by their experience of the worship. Uh, they will evaluate the music. Uh, is it music they like? Is it music they know? Is it music that they are comfortable with? They'll evaluate the preaching. Uh, is it relevant? Uh, is it biblical? Is it uplifting? They may even evaluate the prayers, though in many churches my observation is the prayer seems to be getting a reduced role in many of the worship services that go on in our churches. Now, being part of a consumer culture, we all tend to evaluate what goes on in the worship service by how it makes us feel. And we assess worship like we assess any products that we buy. We bring to our worship an expectation. You know, our worship, it will lift us up. It will renew our spirits. It will help us encounter God afresh. And all of those Dimensions to worship are great things to expect and hope for from our time of worship. Now, we need to encounter God and each other in ways that will lift us up in the midst of our life struggles. We need that fresh experience of God to renew our hearts and remind us that we do not walk this journey of life alone. And so it's not surprising that we bring to our worship on Sundays an expectation that's going to be positive, uplifting and renewing. But there are moments when worship needs to be confronting. There are moments in our lives where our worship needs to be disturbing and confronting. Because there are moments in our lives when we need to be confronted by God because we need to change how we are living. There are moments when we need to realign our lives with the kingdom of God and lovely experiences of worship don't tend to do that. Now, while we may come to our experiences of worship with an expectation that it's going to stir and lift us up, we also need to come with an openness to being confronted by God about something that we may need to change in our lives. We need to come to worship with a readiness to being confronted and confronted by what God has to say to us. Unfortunately, what often happens when worship is confronting is that people just go and worship somewhere else where it is not so confronting. 
When we do not like the message, we go in search of another messenger, one that will make us feel comfortable. We will go in search of another expression of worship that will simply allow us to stay the same and not change. You know, the people of Israel entered into their experiences of worship with the expectation that they would have an encounter with Yahweh that would bring blessing to their lives. They did not enter into their experiences of worship with a desire to be changed. They weren't interested in changing. They certainly didn't enter into worship with an openness of being examined by God. They just wanted their worship of Yahweh to affirm how they were living. Well, in what is a very confronting experience of worship for them, Amos pulls apart their expectations. In their time of worship, Yahweh speaks a confronting word. And this is something that God needs to do from time to time with all of his people. Now, when we come in worship each Sunday, now we will sing our songs, we will have our various prayers, we'll have our Bible reading, there will be a reflection on the word. All of these things are expressions of our worship life. And if our heart's desire is to follow Jesus, then we need to also be open to being confronted by our experiences of worship. And the confrontation, you know, it's not about making our lives miserable. It's about God's desire for us to change and become more like Christ. Now, we may not like being confronted, and very few of us do, but there are moments when that's exactly what we need. And God will sometimes and often times will use our experience of worship to do that. He will confront us in our worship. The second challenge that Amos leaves us with is about the sovereign freedom of God. You know, the people of Israel, due to their understanding of the covenant, had developed a theology that basically concluded that they would always be secure in the hands of Yahweh. It was a theology that narrowed down the acts of Yahweh solely to the dealings with the people of Israel. A theology that Israel held onto in the face of the messages of judgment that were being announced. Now, Israel held to a theology of exceptionalism, in which they were the exceptional nation in the world who enjoyed the sole attention of Yahweh. And as that exceptional nation, they expected Yahweh's ongoing protection, they expected Yahweh's power to be aimed at their enemies to ensure their ongoing survival, and their theology of exceptionalism made the message of judgment a totally incomprehensible truth. Because there is a sense in which the people of Israel respond to the words of judgment from Amos with just disbelief and rejection. As far as they are concerned, Yahweh would never, never turn his back on his people. Well, in what is a radical and devastating statement in verses 7 to 8, Yahweh shatters this theology of exceptionalism. Yahweh points out that he's not just the God of Israel, but he is the sovereign God of the universe who is free to do as he chooses with the other nations as well. And so to rub salt into Israel's wounds, Yahweh refers in verse 7 to two particular nations, the Cushites and the Philistines. Now, the Cushites are basically a people that the Israelites only know as slaves. The Cushites were certainly not a people that the Israelites treated as equal. They were just a source for slaves. And as far as the Israelites are concerned, they are a people who are irrelevant to Yahweh. And yet what does Yahweh declare in verse 7? Are not you, Israelites, the same to me as the Cushites? Now, what a humiliating comparison for the people of Israel. You know, they saw themselves as an exceptional nation before God. But Yahweh points out that the slave nation of Cush is on equal footing with the people of Israel. 
You know, the people of Israel had forgotten that their exceptional status was not about privilege. It was about responsibility. They were called by Yahweh to be a blessing to the world. They were supposed to be witnesses to the other nations. But they had made it all about themselves. Well, to add further salt into their wounds, Yahweh then introduces the exodus from Egypt, which is the single most defining action for the people of Israel. The people of Israel have grown up with the understanding that the exodus was Yahweh's act to create them as his own people. And therefore, the exodus made them exceptional in the world. But Yahweh points out that the historic migrations, you know, of the Philistines from Kaphta and the Arameans from Kir are actually on the same footing as the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. These two nations who have been classic enemies of Israel share in the same activity of Yahweh in their own nation's history. In his sovereign freedom, Yahweh engages all of the nations of the world, not just the people of Israel. Now, this insight to God that we encounter here in Amos is quite challenging because too often we reduce the actions of God to those things that fit our worldview. We live with the expectation that God only works within that specified context, upholding the nations that we believe in, that we like, protecting us from our enemies. But God is not owned by any particular nation or people. God is the sovereign Lord of the universe who is free to do whatever he wants to do in the act of fulfilling his purposes for the world. God acts in the nations of the world and he has done so throughout history. We may not always recognise or understand this, but that is okay. What we need to ensure is that we do not place a limitation on where God can act and on what God can do. Because you see, it's the sovereign freedom of God that actually makes hope possible. It's the sovereign freedom of God that makes assurance possible. And the moment we reduce the size of God, we are left with nothing. Now, it may be unsettling to worship a God of sovereign freedom, but this God has revealed to us that he is a sovereign God, but he is also a God of justice, of compassion and love and grace. And that's why we're able to walk with God because of who he is. Tony Campolo, who uh, an American evangelist, told a story many years ago about a church that he encountered in the southern states of America in one of his uh, preaching trips. It was a very large and vibrant congregation that was a joy to be a part of their worship and to experience it. But Campolo thought it seemed to be a bit of a social anomaly because his church had a racially diverse congregation, but it was in a wider community that was still racially segregated. And so intrigued by this somewhat paradox, Campolo asked one of the older members of the church as to how this church came to be so richly diverse when its community was so segregated. Well, the old man told Campolo that in its early years, the church was very much reflective of its local community. It was a whites-only church, and it was proud that it was a whites only only church. The church was not large and so it relied on all of its lay preachers from the congregation. And most of those lay preachers would get up each Sunday and they would reinforce the whites only status of the church and God's preference for white people, except for the old man that Campolo was talking to. One Sunday this man was given the opportunity to preach and he got up and he preached a confronting message that challenged the racism of everyone in that church congregation. Well, as you may expect, uh, such preaching was quite offensive 
uh, to just about everyone in the church. People started to leave the church as a role of the preacher because every time he got up to preach, he hammered them again and again about their racism. He continued to preach that same confronting message. The deacons came together and they tried to sack him. But he pointed out, I'm not paid. You can't sack me. Um, he in turn sacked the deacons. He went on to tell Campolo that he preached that whites only church down to a congregation of just 20 people. He emptied the place. But then God did something very special. Once they were down to that very small group, people of different races started to come to the church. This small church community was living out the love and grace of God. This church continued to grow as God continued to bring racially diverse people into this church community. And this racially diverse church community still lived in a social context that was still racially segregated. But they were living out the kingdom of God. And God blessed them in amazing ways. Through the ministry of this one old white man, God confronted the church in its worship. Confronted about the changes they needed to make in order to reflect the kingdom of God. But many in that initial white congregation did not like being confronted. They were not interested in being confronted. They wanted their worship to affirm their existing beliefs, their existing prejudices, their existing life. In the face of God's confronting message, most of them left. But once they'd gone, it gave God the freedom to renew the church in transforming ways. You know, it's great when we come to church and we enjoy our time of worship. It's great when we can have our hearts lifted and our souls renewed by our time of worship. But we need to ensure that we're also open to the sovereign freedom of God who can confront us in our worship so that we may be transformed. Now, being confronted by God, it's never easy. It's never comfortable. But if we are open to what God has to say, then our future is filled with God-filled possibilities. So let's pray. Our gracious Father, you come to us at times with words that are not always that easy to hear. But Lord, we need to be confronted, we need to be shaken because we don't always have it right. And you're always inviting us to pursue you, to be more like you and to build your kingdom. Lord, may we always be open to hearing your confronting word and allowing that word to speak deeply into our hearts so that we may know your truth and your truth will set us free. So continue to speak, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.